Good evening, Zealous. Welcome to Sunday Service. My name is Joshua and I'll be your host for the evening. Um, before we move into praise and worship, uh, there's one thing that I wanted to share with you. There's a certain word uh, that's been pressed against my heart and the word is thankful. There are so many things that I'm thankful for during this season. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to tell us the things that you're thankful for this particular evening. Um, it, could be, uh, it could be with regards to your work, it could be that your near and dear ones are still healthy. There are so many different things that you could be thankful for. Um, whilst you do that, uh, with the same thankful heart, I would like to invite the band to lead us into praise and worship. Yeah. 
everyone, welcome back to our online experience. I hope uh, you were able to join in for that incredible time of worship. Wherever you're tuning in from, whether you're watching this by yourself or with your loved ones or with your family members from your living room, from your bedroom, from your kitchen or even on the move, we are glad that you are here with us on this, on this incredible uh, online experience. Man, I want to tell you, God is good. And he is on the move. You know, over the last few weeks, it's been incredible testimonies. It's been incredible stories of his goodness, of his favor, of his mercies that we have been, uh, you know, receiving. So I want to remind you once again, if you have a story, if you have a testimony, if you have, if you have experienced the goodness of God in your life, we want to urge you, we want to tell you to share your stories with us. You know, we, we have seen healings, we have seen uh, job provisions, we have seen miraculous provisions happen in various circumstances in the lives of the people in the community. I want to tell you, you can experience the goodness of God even through the crazy times that we all are going through. I want to, I want to just step this up and tell you, man, it's been such encouraging times when we hear stories like this. But we're going to be diving in straight to our talk uh, for this evening. Hey, uh, I don't know if you've been really waiting to step out and uh, start traveling. You remember those times where you used to just hop from one city to another, just move from this one, one place or, or, or just head on to your favorite destination? I mean, uh, there's this phase where I used to travel quite a bit and... Uh, one thing that I love about cities is, is not just their fancy names or not just their unique names, but, but, the, but the culture and everything that you can get to experience and witness. And, and the names even, right? Cities and their names have so many stories attached to them and, and it helps people identify certain, certain, you can even identify certain cities from their unique qualities and their unique features. Some of them even identify or call out the, uh, the, the nature of the cities and towns because of the people that are there. You know, like, like for instance, I mean, what comes to your mind when you hear the, uh, the city of Paris? Paris is, is one of the definitions or the names given to it is called the city of love. Uh, New York, for instance, is called the Big Apple. Mumbai, you know, uh, the, it's, most of you would, would know about it as a city that never sleeps, right? I mean, it's got Bollywood, it's got this whole bunch of uh, entrepreneurship, a lot of businesses and a lot of folks that are there. It's a financial capital of our country. And then you have our city, Pune, that is called the Oxford of the East. You know, for, for the n number of uh, educational institutions, the schools, the colleges, you know, all the, 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 the facilities for education that are there in our cities. And it's, it's crazy that there's quite a lot, like I said, we get to learn about cultures, about the history, about the art, and, and about even faith for that matter from some of these world cities and, and towns because these cities and these towns kind of embody uh, these, these facts through, and, and, uh, through their features as well. The reason I'm, I'm getting all of us to, to kind of start thinking about that is because I hope this particular talk would, would help us learn from this little town that is mentioned in the Bible. As we dive into our conversation today, I want us to look at a particular conversation between Jesus and the people of his own town. This is, this is a very powerful, this is a very prophetic moment in the life of Jesus where he desires to help people of his own town, of his own hood, you know, kind of uh, know about himself, know about the true identity of who Jesus is. And it is such a great description for us to learn from when it comes to truth, when it comes to topics like familiarity and even rejection. I'll, I'll, we'll look into that. Let's read Mark uh, chapter 6 from verses 1 to 6. We're reading from the Passion Translation. It says, Afterward, Jesus left Capernaum 
and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. On Sabbath, he went to teach in the synagogue. Everyone who heard his teaching was overwhelmed with astonishment. They said among themselves, what incredible wisdom has been given to him. Where did he receive such profound insights? And what mighty miracles flow through his hands? Isn't this Mary's son, the carpenter, the brother of Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? In case if you don't know, those are the real brothers of Jesus. And don't his sisters all live in Nazareth? And they took offense at him. Can you say that with me? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is treated uh, with honor everywhere except in his own hometown, among his relatives and his own house. He was unable to do any great miracle in Nazareth except to heal a few sick people by laying hands upon them. He was amazed at the depth of their unbelief. The writer Mark helps us see this entire episode in a very brief manner where Jesus is rejected by his own people for telling the truth. For telling the truth. Can you imagine that? I mean, not because he took advantage of the, of the people uh, in, in the synagogue, not because he cheated on them, uh, not because he was gossiping about the people over there. He was rejected by the people of his very own town in the synagogue. I mean, we are talking about the people of faith. We are talking about the church folks for, the, for that matter. These are the people who rejected Jesus for what? For telling them the truth. When I was prepping for this talk, right, I thought I, I really wanted to share uh, with us how to handle rejection the Jesus way. How to handle rejection the Jesus way. I, I thought, I mean, that sounds something that, that some of us would, would want to hear and, and even put it into practice, right? But then, but then God really uh, put this on my heart to relook into this passage and see what we need to hear. Not what we want to hear, but what we really need to hear. For a while, I felt we should look at this passage from the lens of Jesus. You know, the, the thoughts of rejection, the, everything that he would have felt when, when he would have seen those comments and those statements come in. But I believe in the time and the season that we are in, we need to look at what's happening in this particular narrative or in this particular situation from the lens of the people who are involved in this story. Because when you start reading and seeing things from that light, you understand that Nazareth does not just resemble a bunch of people. Nazareth is a condition. And I want to title my talk for this evening, if you've not figured it by now, I want to call it a condition called Nazareth. A condition called Nazareth. Come on, can some of you put that in chat? Can, can some of you say it to the person who you're watching this with? Let's not, let's not go quiet. I know this is an online gathering where I do most of the talking and some of you guys do some of the talking in the chat. But come on, can we, can we keep those conversations going? Why don't you say this with me? A, a condition called Nazareth. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for every single person uh, tuning in watching this from wherever they are, or, and even those who would be listening or watching this in the weeks, months, and even years to come. I pray, God, that your word would go forth with clarity, uh, would do the work that you intend for it to do, Lord, in our lives, because we need your living word. We need your words, oh God, to, to bring sense, to bring clarity, to bring meaning and purpose into everything that is happening in our lives. Holy Spirit, that you would lead us right now. Take charge and uh, let, me, let me bring this home the way you want it to be, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are talking about a condition called Nazareth. Let me, let me break this down right for you by asking you this simple question. What was Jesus communicating to the people at the synagogue 
that they were so deeply offended and refused to believe him. Now, not, they were not just like, you know, uneasy about what he had to say. They were not just a, a little bit ticked off. They, the Bible says they were deeply offended. They were not just offended, they were deeply offended. Like I said, you know, Mark gives an overview of this episode. But the same scenario is written so well by Dr. Luke. I'm serious. Luke kind of pens the same incident in, in a slightly more descriptive manner. Hey, Luke was a physician. That's why, that's why the doctor title. And, and he kind of gives a more in-depth, uh, uh, kind of covers a whole bunch of details and, and, and things when, we, when he narrates uh, this, this same uh, story. Let's read that for a better understanding on a condition called Nazareth. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, and we are reading from verse 16. This is what it says. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been raised, he went into the synagogue, as he always did on the Sabbath day. When Jesus came to the front uh, to read the scriptures, they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and, and read where it is written. This is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to be hope for the poor, freedom for the brokenhearted, and, news, uh, and, and new eyes for the blind and to preach to prisoners you are set free. I have come to share this message of jubilee for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. After he read this, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the minister and sat down. Everyone stared at Jesus, wondering what he was about to say. They, then he added, these scriptures came true today in front of you. Everyone was impressed by how well Jesus spoke in awe of the beautiful words of grace that came from his lips. But, can, I, can you guys say that? But, they were, they were surprised at his presumption to speak as a prophet. So they said among themselves, who does he think he is? This is Joseph's son who grew up here in Nazareth. Haven't we all been in that space and in that moment when it comes to our faith? Where, where we are so impressed and, and we are so amazed at the words and, and, uh, and the works of the hands uh, of Jesus until they have to become a reality in our lives. Have you, have you guys been there? I mean, until the time where, where we are to put them into practice and apply them in, in every area of our lives. You guys know what I'm talking about. Let me, let me give you an example. I mean, if, you, if you've been a Christ follower for some time, you, you would have heard this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. You know, this is, this is one of the classic uh, uh, commandments, the, the two greatest commandments that, that Jesus uh, emphasizes on. And this is the first one. And, and when we hear this, it's like, oh my goodness, this is so good. I mean, this is, this is to a certain extent, it's possible, it's beautiful, such profound words. But like I said, this is the first part. This is the first part. And then we go into the second part where Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And you're like, oh, okay. This, this is where it's getting real. Uh, Jesus, do I really have to do that? I mean, why me? Why, why do I have to love? Why, why now? Like, can't he do that? Or is there, some, is there some way that we can sort this out? Or can I just stick to the first part where I continue loving you and doing things just for you? You know, I don't want to be bothered about the people around me. Have you guys been in that space? See, we all encounter moments where the truth of the gospel message clashes with the ideals and principles of our hearts, which may not always be grounded on God's standards. And if you have not gotten there yet in your, in your Christian uh, walk, in your Christian faith, trust me, you will get there. You will get there where, where everything that, that you hear from the, from, the, from the scriptures or everything that you learn about the message of the gospel, at one point, it starts to clash with your ideas, with your understanding, with your principles, and, and which are, like I said, which may not be always rooted or based on God's standards. But, but how we respond and handle those moments really help 
uh, each one of us define the depth of our understanding for the decision that we have made when we say, I believe in Jesus and I decided and I have decided to follow him. Our responses during the, the, those moments kind of really help us understand how, how, how committed we are to that decision. See, the people got offended at Jesus when he mentioned about the fulfillment of the scripture that he pointed out. They, they refused to believe what he, what he said because they had already made up their mind about what they wanted to believe. About what they had an idea about Jesus. You know when certain people always tend to still associate you with your early days or your past lifestyles? Have you, have you ever been in those kind of conversations? I mean, family reunions for that matter, extended family reunions. Like, do you, do you, can you think about that one particular relative or a few of them, for some of you, or an elderly figure in your life who meets you after a really long time and who always remember you when you were that little kid? <laughs> you, you know that times, like, or oh, 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 when you were that little brat, you know, when, when they, they remember you for, for all the cute definitions or all the things that they remember when you were that little kid. You know, they've got those memories. And, and right now when you're hearing those things, you're like in, in a way embarrassed. You're in a way like, okay, I don't, I don't really want to talk about it. And in your mind, you're going like, okay, I'm not the same anymore. I've changed. I mean, I mean these, are, these are conversations that you have. And like you want to yell those things out, but you know that's not the truth about you. People identify you based on your past or your present. But Jesus gives you an identity that is based on your glorious future. Maybe these people had seen Jesus grow up as a kid in front of their eyes. And that little toddler, that, that little teenager... I mean, that, that little adult who's here in front of us now reading from the scroll of Isaiah. I mean, he's a prophet. Who the heck are you? I mean, I don't know if they actually said that, but you never know. They might be thinking that. And, and because that's, that's exactly what they said, right? They, let's, let's read Mark chapter 6 and, and the third verse again. This is what it says. This is, these are some of these comments. I don't know if it's one person saying this or a bunch of them saying it, but this is recorded. That's what they said. Isn't this Mary's son, the carpenter, the brother of Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? And don't his sisters all live here in Nazareth? And they took offense at him. See, the people around him failed to see Jesus as the Messiah, the savior of humanity, the one true living God who was in the midst of them. They failed to see him because they had become too familiar with the identities that they had created about him for themselves. Even when Jesus made an attempt to, to spell out the truth for them, the result of that was not awe, the result of that was not this reverence, but the result of that was offense and rejection. See, they were so comfortable and, and they were so so they were just so fine with the impressive words and they were just so amazed at the words, works of Jesus, but they did not want to take the leap of giving themselves fully to this idea that the one who's talking to us is a savior and, and, and kind of proclaim their faith in that Messiah who they had been, in fact, waiting for for so many centuries. And this is the sad reality when we become so familiar with our relationship, in our relationship with Jesus. We are too comfortable and maybe sometimes too impressed with what God does, but fail to be convicted and transformed because of who he really is. Let me say that again, because in case if you have missed out that, you might have missed out the entire crux on what I'm trying to communicate through this talk. We are too comfortable and impressed with what God does, but fail to be convicted and transformed because of who he is. 
we we may have become so immune and and so familiar with the patterns of god that there is no there is there, there is almost no room or very less room for his wonder to take place in our lives we we are so familiar with hearing the written words of the scriptures that we don't tend to give ourselves the opportunity to see those scriptures come to life in our very situations that you and me caught up are, are caught up in we we may be becoming so comfortable with listening about this jesus that we hear someone else talk about but we are not taking out that individual time to see who he really is and what he means for every one of us and and when we're seeing these things happen can i just break this to you we have gotten ourselves into a nazareth condition we've gotten ourselves into a nazareth condition nazareth for our context or or in our today's context is not just a city or a town we can talk about but it is a condition of our hearts that we really need to deal with we need to deal with this because see in this scenario right we we are not the victims of rejection in this particular scenario we are not the victims of rejection we are the ones who may be rejecting the eternal and the absolute truth that jesus is offering to everybody we could be those people you see the irony of this of this season that you are you and me are caught up in the irony of this time that we we may be so unfamiliar with what happening with what's happening around us we might be so unfamiliar with the current times but overtly familiar with the ways of god you see the beauty of the presence of god the 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 majestic nature and and the wonder of god during our moments of worship whether it's your private uh, personal moments or even the corporate worship times you know the the unconditional love of god the extravagant grace of jesus christ have we allowed ourselves to become so familiar to these truths i mean i mean seriously is that where we have come or is that where we are heading these may have become so common these may have become so mundane because you experienced this in all its fullness once upon a time you remember those times where where you where you were like so filled with the love of god you were so filled with what jesus has done for you but now it it's beginning to look so familiar and there is a cost there is a cost to that familiarity lifestyle we end up paying we we are not just blinded or we are not just ignorant of this truth we ourselves become roadblocks in our spiritual journey and in our spiritual growth and sometimes it's it's not really the magnitude of the problem or the situations that you need freedom and deliverance from we need freedom from a familiarity mindset we need freedom from a familiarity mindset let me let me say that over somebody tonight give me the permission to speak that into your life we need freedom from a familiarity mindset most of the challenges that we go through in our lives is because we have not allowed the fullness and the majestic power of jesus to take complete control in our lives and in every situation of of whatever we are caught up in you see you can see you know there's a there's a there's this stark difference when the people who were ideally supposed to recognize and submit to the true identity of Jesus that the so-called church folks are far from it because of their familiar mindset i mean this guy we know this guy this guy grew up in front of us we've seen him as a kid we've seen him grow up we we know his family he's 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 a carpenter his his mother is mary like there were talks about her that she gave birth to in this unnatural way but but i mean look at the other brothers they they all like we, we know this family it's a familiar mindset it's a familiar mindset that you and me need a freedom from see because in that same chapter as you as you glance down luke helps us see that when Jesus moves out from Nazareth and comes into Capernaum to teach there's a there's a there's an incident where a demon possessed man 
starts speaking and and he speaks of, of with a with a full understanding of the power and the true identity of Jesus you know Jesus sets him free during during that moment but let's read Luke 4 31 to 35 from the passion translation this is what it says Jesus went to Capernaum in Galilee and taught the people on the Sabbath day His teaching stunned and dazed them for he spoke with penetrating words that manifested great authority. The con- in the congregation there was a demonized man who screamed out with a loud voice, "Hey you! Go away and leave us alone. I know who you are. You are a Jesus of Nazareth, God's holy one. God's holy One. Let me read that again. What he says: You are Jesus of Nazareth. But he doesn't stop there. He says, "God's holy one. Why are you coming to meddle with us? You have come to destroy us already." Just then, the demon hurled the man down on the floor in front of them all. But Jesus rebuked the demon. Be quiet and come out of him. And the demon came out of him without causing any harm. A few things that really stood out to me. For was the willingness and the obedience of the people in this setting to listen to Jesus not just not just get impressed not just get motivated not just get to comfortable in listening to him but also allow the truth to set them free now he says you're Jesus from Nazareth of course he 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 Jesus never never shied away from the fact that he was he he represented this small town. Yes, he was from Nazareth, but but he is also the holy one. Yes, he was the son of the carpenter, but he is also the savior of the world. He grew up in front of these people of Nazareth, but he is the only anointed one sent by God for the redemption of humanity. and and what what the difference that we see in these two settings is the fact that one 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 segment of people got so familiar in seeing the Jesus of Nazareth that they forgot to see the messiah that was there at the same person yet we see that a person who's demon possessed who's sitting in that is is kind of calling out the true identity and the true nature of who Jesus is not just a carpenter's son but the savior of the world god's holy one the folks in capernaum did not allow the nazareth condition to hinder the move of god in their lives they did not see that i pray and i firmly hope that we never get so complacent and we never feel so mundane to the powerful life-giving message of the gospel of Jesus for our lives that that we would we would truly desire to be a community that allows ourselves to be blown away with this all powerful all glorious and and the majestic god who desires to surprise us with his goodness and his love and his grace you know let's not get so caught up doing community life that we fail to allow ourselves to fall in awe of Jesus let's not become so familiar with the ways and the works of God that you miss out on the miracles and the wonders that he still wants to do in your life and through your life Let us be people who amaze Jesus with the depth of our faith and not your unbelief. What would really be heartbreaking and saddening is that if we're constantly just so impressed and amazed at the words of Jesus but refuse to fully allow his redemptive power to work in our lives. And today I believe God is waiting on you to experience his tangible presence. Let me say that again. God is waiting on you to experience his tangible presence. His his love and his extravagant grace in every area of your life. Why don't we allow Jesus to surprise you? 
Why don't we allow him to lavish you with his love? Why don't we allow Jesus to, 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 to blow us away with his goodness? Because like I said, the, the only thing, the one thing that can really stop you and that can stop me from experiencing Jesus in his fullness and in his power is our familiarity. I believe Jesus wants to really reach out. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to just allow him to do what he does best. The redemptive work of Jesus is, 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 is the most important thing that we all need in our life. And if that's you, if you have been waiting to, 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 to see that happen in your life, if you have never made a decision to follow Jesus, if you, if you have just allowed yourself to be impressed, if you have just allowed yourself to be amazed by the works of Christ uh, and have never taken the leap of faith to truly trust him as the, as the savior of humanity, as the Lord of your life, Tonight can be your moment. If that's you, if you have been listening to this talk and say, hey, you know what, Nanad, I think I, think I fall in that category that I've, I think Jesus is a good person, he's a good teacher, but you've never really made that decision to follow Christ. I think this is your moment. This is the moment that God has, has created for you to make that decision. And if that's you, I want to pray along with you right now. You just need to make this simple prayer. Jesus I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I choose to put my trust in you. I believe you are the Lord of my life. I declare that with my mouth and I confess every wrong that I would have done. I want to receive you in my heart. I want to receive and I want to experience your love, your grace, and the purpose that you bring, the joy that you bring. Because of everything that you did on the cross, I am a new person in you. Jesus, I give you my life. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Man, I want to tell you, if you have made that prayer, I want to tell you this is one of the best decisions you can ever make. This is seriously one of the best decisions you can ever make. Giving your life to Jesus, I'm telling you, heaven is celebrating with us right now for those decisions that have been made. And I'm sure if, if this is the first time you've ever tried out something like this, you would have a lot of doubts. You may have a lot of questions, which is completely okay. Uh, we would love to help you out. We've got a bunch of our friends on chat right now. You're, you know, they, they're called the hosts of the chat. Uh, you can reach out to them, just ping them or, or on, on the chat. Or if you have more questions about this journey of Christian faith and want to explore more uh, with us, just like how we are exploring on this journey, uh, you can just click on the next step button and uh, we would love to connect with you, get to know you and do this journey together. I want to tell you once again, don't allow the condition of Nazareth. Let's stay away from that condition. Let's, let's call it out. Let's identify it and let's pursue Jesus and allow ourselves to be blown away by his goodness, by his love and by his grace. Now with the same thankful heart, we invite you to bless the Lord with our tithes and offerings. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Everything we own and everything we have comes from the Lord. When we give, what we do is we simply just give a small portion of the abundance that He has blessed us with. With doing this act, He blesses us more. So there are two ways that you can do this. You can scan the QR code or you can simply press the Give Now button.
We've come to the end of today's online experience. Hope it's been great. Uh, before we go, uh, here's a reminder as to what's happening this week. Tuesdays, we have our community prayers, wherein as a church, we stand together and pray for the prayer requests that we've received. Wednesdays and Thursdays, uh, we have our online connect groups where we meet in smaller groups, we play games and we do live together. It's an amazing time. And lastly, we do have a post-gathering Zoom call at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Please get in touch with our hosts to get in more details how you can be a part of it. And see you guys next Sunday at 5.45 p.m. for a live chat hangout and 6 p.m. for our online experience. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.